The sophomore slump is defined as when a band or artist puts out an album that fails to live up to the relatively high standards of their debut. It's happened to some big names in rock and metal history. A month ago, I talked about amazing sophomore albums. Well, this time we are gonna look at the bands who hit the slump. Not a top 10, no ranking, just a list. Also, just because a band hit the sophomore slump doesn't mean they're automatically a bad band. I need to say that because I know there will be some butthurt comments on this video. It's gonna happen. You know how these videos work? Let's get to it. Going back to the early 90s where Spin Doctors had their huge debut album Pocket Full of Kryptonite that went five times platinum in the United States and then had two hit songs which were huge. For kind of a goofy alternative band with music made for the background of frat parties, Spin Doctors did amazing. How could they be stopped after a song like Two Princes? The answer to that is their follow-up album Turn It Upside Down. Don't get it twisted that it was a huge flop because the album did go platinum based off their first month of sales, but it was considered a massive step down for the label for Spin Doctors and the band would have trouble charting going forward. With the surge of grunge and alternatives, Spin Doctors were already considered obsolete by 1994. Some say that Spin Doctors were a one album fluke back in 91 and 92, and that statement might have been bolstered by subsequent album releases. The band is still listed as active and their most recent album came out in 2013. Will there be a Spin Doctors revival from all the fans demanding a comeback? Eh... Sticking with the 90s, there is some nostalgia as soon as you hear a couple notes from Hootie and the Blowfish. How can you not remember these guys? It was a glorified bar band whose debut would go on to sell over 21 million copies in the United States. Hootie Mania was running wild in the mid-90s. The follow-up album, Fairweather Johnson, was all but prime for success. Debuted at number one on Billboard 200, and it was all downhill from there. Fairweather Johnson would reach platinum status after a great first week, but then fall into complete obscurity. It became clear that the summer of Hootie was long over. Fairweather Johnson would virtually be the downfall of the band, as their label Atlantic at the time was wildly disappointed with the performance, as was the band because they really tried to improve and make more meaningful music. It did not work out well. Hootie, Darius Rucker, would go on to do just fine for himself after though, and back in 2019, Hootie and the Blowfish returned to go on tour with Bare Naked Ladies for more nostalgic music. I don't know why, but a supergroup ending up with the name Hootie and the Bare Naked Ladies would be amazing. I don't even care what the music was. I just want that to happen and to be put on a t-shirt. Meatloaf, one of the best-selling musicians of all time worldwide and having multiple entries through different generations of music, also a survivor of the sophomore slump. After a debut like Bad Outta Hell, it's hard to really top expectations, but the history behind Meatloaf's second album, Dead Ringer, is a rough one, along with having significantly less sales and success. What's shocking is that Dead Ringer was also a Jen Steinman written and produced album, just like Bad Outta Hell. The problem? Meatloaf had a rough few years after that debut, and the lead-up to Dead Ringer was filled with delays, re-recordings, cancelled projects, touring, and drugs. Yeah, it was the late 70s, and that was just life back then for big musicians. The album would go platinum in the UK, but Dead Ringer was seen as a massive step down, and many wondered if Meatloaf had expired. Fortunately, the man would rebound, several times in fact, over the years through music and acting. 70-plus-year-old Meatloaf is still saying he's not old and that he has future plans for new music. Meatloaf has a wild history, but he should get all the credit in the world for his legendary performance as Jack Black's dad in The Pick of Destiny. I guess the Bad Out of Hell albums too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Seriously, The Pick of Destiny. When I went on Twitter asking for sophomore slump suggestions, many people said The Killers. After the smash success of Hot Fuss, many people thought The Killers could do no wrong. Many people, except for critics, who blasted Samstown for being too big for its britches, to put it lightly, as The Killers' second album was significantly different from the five times platinum certified debut. Samstown would still do fairly well going platinum in the US and continue to sell well in the UK, but along with critics and Island Records, The Killers themselves were disappointed with the reception and sales of Samstown. It also did not help that Brandon Flowers hyped up the album before release, saying Samstown would be the best new thing in 20 years. That comment might have come off as a bit big-headed at the time. Though many people call sophomore slump for the band back in the day, the killers still pushed on with Samstown, and it became an album that over time was much more appreciated as being personal and sincere while trying to make something different than Mr. Brightside. Good for them for sticking with it and trying something new. Go back in time to the early 90s after the success of The Stone Roses started to grow through word of mouth and their amazing debut album. It was a slow 
reception for the Manchester band, but over a couple years, the debut would go four times platinum and see success overseas, making the band a big name. People were desperate for a second album, and after five years from their debut, including several years away from touring, as well as refusing to do media interviews for many years, Second Coming finally came to light in 1994. Truth be told, the Stone Roses never stood a chance living up to the mountain of expectations from their fans, critics, and the world of music all built for a second album. Second Coming did not do well, and Little Limelight was shined on the follow-up for many reasons, mainly because too much time has passed for people to pay attention, along with those massive expectations not being met. Through the next two years, band members would leave and the Stone Roses officially broke up in 97 with Ian Brown going solo. This album was no second coming for the group to say the least, and many attribute their sophomore slump to the ending the band's career at the time. It's a great example of what could have been. Remember when Jet was a thing? If you don't remember the Australian band, you definitely were put in the way of their music with Are You Gonna Be My Girl played on a loop for a solid year. The debut album Get Born went platinum in the US and eight times platinum in Australia, along with many other nations. The follow-up album Shine on was hyped. It was recorded, sent off, and accidentally leaked two weeks early by iTunes. Oops. Along with the music leaking, the album received mixed and mediocre reviews from critics who formerly praised the band, including Pitchfork who made a graphic album review posting in their edgy Pitchfork way, along with a 0 out of 10 rating. It was a brutal sophomore slump of epic proportions. Regardless of the leak and all those Shine On would go platinum one time in Australia, the album did not come close to the success of the debut a week after true album release in 2006. The group would release a third album which would fall even further compared to the debut, and Jet would not put out another studio album as of 2009. Two things to remember about Jet. One, though Jet hit the sophomore slump, the band was not a one-hit wonder. They had several songs chart. Two, Jet may not have been great, but they deserved better than Pitchfork's review consisting of a monkey peeing on itself. That happened. Seriously, Pitchfork, you are awful. Back in 2004, the darkness was on top of the world, and everyone was singing along with I Believe in a Thing Called Love. Their debut Permission to Land sold well in the US, and their home in the UK with a classic rock flair and over-the-top style. It was infectious, and everyone wanted more. Or so we thought. The band's second album, One Way Ticket to Hell and Back, failed to grab anyone's attention in the end of 2005, as it barely even had single rotation in the UK and received nothing in the US. What's worse is that this follow-up album was produced by Roy Thomas Baker of Queen fame and cost roughly 1 million euros to make. That is a huge loss for a young band trying to continue on. Reviews were also mixed for the album as the classic rock revival was oddly too ahead of its time, which is a weird thing to say about a revival, but I promise that makes sense. The darkness is still together, however, with Justin Falcon's fault settling his brains out, and the band even has a new album coming out in 2021. I guess in some ways, they really did go to hell and back. Speaking of 2005, Scotland's Franz Ferdinand did not have much luck with their follow-up to the self-titled debut, which went platinum in the US and four times platinum in the UK. The band sky rocketed to popularity with the single Take Me Out. Franz Ferdinand had a fresh sound at the time and even got a Saturday Night Live spot to play the new single from their upcoming album, You Could Have It So Much Better. Unfortunately, the skyrocketing fizzled out and came back to Earth. You Could Have It So Much Better only received gold certification in the US due to first week sales and also did decent in Japan, oddly enough, but the album disappointed greatly worldwide despite critical acclaim from major outlets across the board. It looks like the industry was really trying to push Franz Ferdinand into the spotlight hard, but nothing came close to the popularity of Take Me Out. Franz Ferdinand are still active, however, with their most recent album coming out in 2018, and the group still does well in touring, and each album they have released over the years does chart for the first week. Franz Ferdinand still has fans out there. As for a band that should not have fans, ugh. Years before Wes Scantlin and company defiled Nirvana's About a Girl, Puddle of Mud was doing quite well for themselves after Fred Durst's blessing with the band's trash debut album Come Clean, which was awful. It was just bad, okay? A second album was inevitable after so much fast success and back in 2003, butt rock was all the rage, so everyone was up for it, right? Well, the sophomore slump hit Scantlin and the band as the follow-up Life on Display would significantly disappoint their label and sales. Where Come Clean went several times platinum in the United States, the follow-up would only be certified gold, which is still a good number, but not good enough for them. With how much was spent on making the album and how hard Life on Display failed to live up to its predecessor, Puddle of Mud lost its major popularity. Go figure, it also didn't help them that the album was critically panned across the board, and radio play was scarce for singles from Life on Display. Thank God. Puddle of Mud hit the sophomore slump hard. Like a cockroach can survive a nuclear bomb, so can West Scantlin find a way to continue on, though. The band's output would sell significantly less with each release, and after all the controversy and Scantlin shenanigans, Puddle of Mud still exists. That cockroach analogy works well for Puddle of Mud. Or at least for Wes Scantlin. 
Think about it. There's been like 19 other band members that have gone in and out of Puddle of Mud, and they've all gone. However, Wes Scantlin still survives, just like a cockroach. Somehow. When talking about albums that are seen as sophomore slumps, one of the more interesting entries comes from U2 with October. Sales-wise, the album didn't exactly fail to live up to the successful boy in 1980 that put U2 on the map, but the following year in 81 saw U2 lose a huge sway of popularity as Bono and company tried to progress and evolve possibly a little too quick. October featured several singles but had significant trouble charting, or at least compared to the likes of I Will Follow from Boy. Another turning point was that October revolved around spirituality and religious expression from the band, which I'm not sure everyone in 1981 was expecting or wanting. Pair all that with mixed reviews that did not praise U2's bold attempt at Bonoism, which I'm sure is a thing, October became one of the Black Sheep albums from U2's impressive career. Some songs like Gloria are still cherished by U2 fans, but the album definitely is not talked about as an accomplishment for the group. Needless to say, Bono, The Edge, and everyone else rebounded just fine with future classic albums, flops, and forced iTunes exclusives. I honestly feel if an album like October October would have come out much later in U2's career, it would have been treated different, but at the time, many people did not know what to think about Bonoism. Understandable. But U2 is a great example of a sophomore slump being an event that can be overcome just like many bands have done and will continue to do. Know of another big sophomore slump album? Leave a comment and let everyone know. Big thanks to my patrons and a special thanks to Brandon Barrettfeld, Chris Doman, and Dom Noble. You can have a say in upcoming videos, get weekly new music playlists, and see videos early by supporting Rocked on Patreon. Click the link in the video description for more info on supporting the channel. Please subscribe and ring the bell to get notified of upcoming videos, and you can keep up to date with Rocked on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Thanks for staying to the end. The next few months will be bonkers for my output, but I'll keep up with it. If you have suggestions for list videos, please let me know in the comments below, especially top 10 best worst list videos. More Rock Coliseum and Regretting the Past will be coming in 2021 as well.